So now let me click in here and join. Are you Tracy? No, um, she's waiting to get in. Oh, she's joining. Here. Right, right. Okay, here, join with video. Okay, so all right, I'm now I'm now in. I'm gonna make you my the host. Okay. Recording. So we are muted. You have full full live here. Yes. And then, do you know how to share your screen? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> do you have your uh, the PowerPoint? I, it's not even a power. It's just it's just going to be a, P, a a PDF document. Oh. Perfect. Just like that. Okay, I'm just gonna take control. Real sure, quick. absolutely. Is this the PDF? It's, it's it's right there, but I'm not sure. Training link. Let me see if that's the same thing. I don't think so. No, no, it is not. Um. You need to find it on my computer itself in the Let's folders. Let's do show all windows. Oh. There it is, right there. Perfect, and then we're gonna go share. Got it. Ta-da. All right, well, it's almost like your little private uh, training class today here because I think we only have one person on the zoom right now which is a shame that uh because I think more more people need it but so be it okay what's your name in the back again Max Max okay and I know Jim and I don't know. If, was somebody else in here who walked out, or just uh, all in, just helping um, with? Right. Okay. All right. This is our class, guys. Cool. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, because we have such a small little window class, we can make this any, anything you guys want it to be. Okay. Um, you know, so is there anything in particular, uh, you know, we can make this more of a, you know, if you want to question and answer session, um, and based on that, uh, um, you know, we then can go uh, any direction you want. All right. Um, I, don't, I don't know the RPA well enough to... Answer questions. All right, let me. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, how many? How, how new are you? Um, I'm about a year. About a year. Uh, okay. How many? You gone through uh, both as buyers agents or listing agents? Buyers. Buyers agents. And did you have any assistance on writing up the offer? One of us a. And I'm assuming it was on the old contract versus the new contract. Yeah. Okay. And so you had assistance at that point on uh, with your mentor. Did you have a mentor or was it Sonia or? Um, Sonia helped me in the first one and then Eric helped me in the second one. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I actually want to see if I can find my RPA. Sure. That would, that would be a good idea if you have a copy of the RPA. Okay. How's your day going, Tracy? It's going well. Thanks. Oops. We'll sit. Yeah. I gotta unmute myself. There we go. Um, it's going well, thanks. Uh, since uh, you got new people there and I'm new too, why don't we see if we could kind of go through 
you know, there's stuff that you don't have, obviously you don't have to go through, but like go by line by line and kind of, you know, talk I about know, the, I figured, I don't know, I'll see if anybody else is right. Right now, nobody, nobody else has signed on even online. <laughs> Oh gosh, you know it's a shame because this class is. Well, wait amazing. a second! Wait a second! Hang on! Hang on! I'm seeing. Hang on! I'm seeing twelve participants here. Oh, I only wait see three. Oh, wait a second! Waiting room. Oh, admit all. There we go. Hang on. Uh -oh, now we got, there you go. Now we got a few more guys. Yeah. There all you go. right. I'm sorry, guys. I'm new. To, I'm still new to, to taking the lead here on this uh, uh, Zoom training. Uh, uh, exercise here so i'm glad to, glad to see we have a few more few few more bodies on the call that's good good to see good to see okay all right Can everybody everybody hear me okay yeah yes excellent excellent maybe all you right. can ask the rest of the group how they feel all right so guys um you know, everyone has a, a little different level of experience right now. And, you know, rather than me initially taking charge of going through line by line, because if I go through line by line initially, um, because the contract is so long, we're really not, we're only going to cover just a fraction. Uh, what I'm willing to do, because I'm sure if one of you have a question, has a question, um, it will pertain to the others as well. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we can potentially start there and, and then if not, I'll start going through, uh, the contract with you and my recommendations of how, how I go about when, when speaking to buyer clients and how to explain the contract. Okay. So, uh, anybody, anybody on the call have an immediate question? or questions, but let's start with the first one if you have multiples. Um, uh, and so feel free to jump in if anybody has an initial question they'd like, they'd like to see addressed. Anybody? Well, thank you for coming everyone. Okay, that makes it easy. All right, so why don't we, why don't we kind of start from the top when, uh, when addressing writing an offer? Because it, it's, it sounds more simplistic than it really is in the sense of the one, th one of the first things when writing up an offer is being able to know how to have the appropriate dialogue and communication uh, with your client. And again, uh, we're going we're gonna to address this training when you're working and writing up an offer with a buyer. OK, uh, the dialogue works a little bit differently, but your knowledge of the contract still needs to be the same uh, when you're representing your sellers on your on your listings. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, right now, let's let's go ahead and, and first address. So first thing when writing an offer is being able to know uh, what kind of an offer you want, you, you know, that the buyer needs to make in order to be the successful buyer of the house. So first thing is to identify what kind of a market is the buyer in when they're writing an offer. So what is our real estate market that we're in right now, guys? What kind of a market? Uh, seller's market. What does the seller's market mean, guys? There are many offers. Say that again. And there are multiple offers to the seller. Multiple offers. A seller's market uh, def definitely means uh, that whichever marketplace it's in, that that particular uh, area is in charge. They are in the, the nice position of not having to be subject to only receiving one offer. And so typically when a, it's a seller's market. It's not just one particular property happens to get multiple offers. It is almost across the board. And this is what we have been seeing for the last year and a half, almost two years of it being a seller's market. And probably 
uh, the most significantly, you know, within the last uh, within the last year. So, so the first dialogue that you need to have even before looking at the contract, uh, and it really has to do with uh, first the pr the pricing conversation. And we're not going to get into today pricing conversation because that is still a whole separate discussion. Okay. Uh, you know, we could have a whole hour class just on how to talk about, uh, you know, what offer a buyer should submit in, in today's, uh, uh, in today's marketplace. And so, uh, you know, what we're talking about then is you now feeling confident on being able to uh, explain the contract I've been able to write the contract with some certainty and some authority uh, to be able to advise your client. Now, I want you to notice what I just said in the sense of uh, when I said, in order for you to advise your client. Now, do we ever tell our clients what they have to do? Never. Anybody else? Do we ever do we ever tell our clients what to do? I think it'd be a good idea to let them know of the options and then let them make the decision. Bingo. That's exactly right. We never tell, we never tell our clients you have to or you must. At least I don't. <laughs> we'll put it that way. <laughs> okay. The buyer, the, the buyers and or the sellers are the makers of their decision. You know, what we have to offer them is our advice. So what we're able to do is be able to say, I highly advise or I highly recommend that you do this or you do that. And here's the reason or reasons why. So first and foremost, understand we are never telling a buyer that they can't do something or they must or they must do something because the ultimate repercussion of whatever they decide is on them. So as an example, let's get into a pricing example for just one moment, you know. If let's say there's a piece of property right now that you just finished showing your buyers and it's listed for $900,000 and you looked at the, and they, and they love it and they wanna write an offer on it. Uh, but at the time in which you showed them the property during the weekend's open house, all right, there happened to be another 20 sets of buyers in the house at the same time. And when you spoke to the listing agent, the listing agent mentioned that, yeah, looks like you're, there's gonna be a lot of offer activity and there's already five offers on the home and, and probably gonna be more by the time offers are due on Monday. And you're now sitting and you're now talking to your buyers on Sunday when the when you already have knowledge that there's five offers on what was the list price I just said it was at 900,000 and your client says I want to write up an offer at 875. What do you tell them? I don't think that's going to make it. That's correct. Okay, but uh, Emilio, I, I, want, I want to write the offer at 875. The seller can always counter me. Well, I would explain, uh, Steve, you know, right now we, like we discussed before, we have about six to seven offers that the listing agency has told us, you know, this property is going to go over asking. So what we want to do is we want to position ourselves where we're at least in the competition to get a counter. So let's go over some of the, some of the, uh, some of the properties that are, have sold them since we last saw the property, and then we can kind of decide on, you can decide where you want to come up, because you know, that, that way they would make us more competitive. Yeah, I know I always can come up, okay. Well, and, and again, we can, we can go, where, I, where I'm trying to go with this is, is ultimately, it is, his, it, it is the client's decision. You're able to, Emilia, you're doing, doing a great job of, of, of advising the client Okay, with regards to the negative of being able to do that. But if the client ultimately says, the only you know, I'm the, the only offer I want to submit is at 875. Okay, you as the agent actually have two choices of being able to do. 
been able to say, okay, I'm going to write it up, but most likely understand not only are you're not your offer not going to get accepted, but most likely you're not even going to get a counter offer to even be in the running to have another opportunity to have at it. And if you're okay with that, I'm okay that you're okay. You know, and, and you also have another opportunity. I've been able to say, you know, I'll be honest about it. You know, you, you know, you have the right to being able to write it at eight at, at eight seventy five. Uh, I really don't think it's going to go there. And I, matter of fact, because I even have knowledge, the agent said it's going to go way over. You don't even have to write the offer. Okay. Now, I don't advise you to do that, at least especially if it's a newer client, at least initially, because really what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to write the offer and have happen of what exactly you are predicting is going to happen with, you know, of what you're advising your client's going to happen. If you write the offer at 875 to a 900,000 list, when we already have five plus offers that will probably end up selling 950 or over, all right, the reality be not only is your offer not going to get accepted, it's not going to get a counter offer. And sure enough, when the reply comes back that your offer was so, you know, so low against all the other offers, we didn't, you know, the seller is not countering. Now you're able to have that other dialogue after you get the word back. Just, just as I predicted, okay, your offer didn't even get a counter offer. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So now let's let's take let's go into the offer itself. Okay. So, you know, I'm old school. I'm going to be very candid with you know. I, I'm not sure how how most of the agents do it today. You know, I mean, I've been selling real estate for for over, uh, um, well, just under forty years, and so uh, you know, we didn't have the computers when I first started, and and we didn't have DocuSign, um, and so it, it's it's definitely one when our you know, when buyers wanted to write up an offer, where did we go? We went into the conference room, also known as the closing room. It's what it was referred to as. Um, and we literally had to sit across the table and be able to not only talk about price, but we had to talk about all the other points in the offer that still needed addressing as well. So, you know, I, I, I guess I come from a little bit of an advantage because I was forced to learn how to explain the contract to the clients right out of the starting gate. You didn't get that option not to of just filling in a template, and sending it through DocuSign and hope then that they just, you know, sign, you know, wherever it was marked for initials and, and signatures. Uh, so, so normally though, whether I do it in person or now over the phone, because half the time I will still do it over the phone and virtually kind of almost go through the contract with them over the phone. And, and for more of our engineer type clients, uh, definitely have done it via Zoom as well, who wants to know literally line by line, paragraph by paragraph. So uh, what are the, when writing an offer, Okay, now after price aside, what, what are the other elements that we wanna make sure that we address with the, the buyers um, in our consultation? And let's call it the offer consultation because that's really what it is, okay? One of the things I definitely do not advise, I will tell you, I do, definitely do not advise when they say, yeah, we wanna write up an offer and you go, let me check with the listing agent, which you should be doing, Okay, how many offers are in? When do they do? How many are you expecting? Okay, and, and are there any are there any terms that your sellers are looking to be able to have incorporated into the offer to be able to best position your client? Um, that uh, the one thing you as their agent should never do is say, here's the price you need to come in at as opposed to what? Here's the price I recommend you be at. Now, again, this isn't gonna be a pricing class, but I will tell you, there's a whole separate set of dialogues that's involved when, when you're talking pricing, you have to look at comparable sales 
And then based on your buyer and the down payment and the loan amount that they are then going to be obtaining, uh, all right, that you're then going to have to have that discussion dealing with, you may be and probably will be paying higher than what the property will appraise for. So we're going to, we're going to end up just kind of putting that aside that you've had that discussion that they acknowledge that most likely they're going to be paying higher than what the property will appraise for and that they're okay with that. All right. And so in this marketplace, many times your buyers are going to go to you and say, outside of price, because there's been so much competition, what can we do to be able to better our chances of being able to get the, being able to get our offer accepted? All right. Because we know it's both price and what's the other other part of the contract? Terms. 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 You got price and terms. Contingencies are part of the terms. Okay. And what is a contingency? Who can define what a contingency is? Anybody brave enough or been able to, to actually know how to explain what a contingency is? Um, yes, I'll try. It's an event that needs to happen before you go on to the next section of the offer. Basically, you can proceed with uh, allowing that and that particular um, be finished so you can move on to the next part of the offer. Well, partially, you know, you, you have you have a little bit of the flavor. Okay. Anybody, anybody else want to take a stab? Sure. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a term. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, it, I, I'm, I'm cheating. I looked it up. I had Siri look it up. It's an okay. acute event or circumstance, which is possible, but cannot be predicted with certainty. Well, that's, that is the, let's call it the Webster's definition. <laughs> okay. Steve, I'll take, I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> okay. Um, it, you know, I, I liken to say maybe it's, it's something that protects your client. Like contingencies are some, a term that, that uh, will protect your client. Like, Bingo. So you have your inspection, you have your appraisal, and you have your loan contingency, right? So each are put in place to protect your client. And what, is a, and what does a contingency mean or do? It protects it gives your buyer. The buyer. It gives your buyer the option to get out of their out of the contract. It allows back out them, of the back out of the contract. Right. It's contingencies in contract are protection clauses, and all contingencies are not protection clauses solely for the buyer. There can also be contingency clauses also on behalf of the seller. The ones that we're going to be addressing initially are buyer contingencies. And a contingency is, is a, an event that if, it, if the event occurs and, the, and within that clause, it allows for uh, the set of circumstances that if, it, if it's based on time or if it's based on percentages such as loans, it allows buyers to be able to contractually back out of the sale penalty free. The key words with contingencies is it allows, you know, it allows the client to be able to back out penalty free. All right. Matter of fact, in, in the olden days, they were known as escape clauses. Ever heard of that phrase, an escape clause? That's what contingency yes, is. So, so as an example, what are what are some of our contingencies in our contracts of our of our real estate contract? Loans, um... getting your loan approved, loan approval, inspection, inspection. appraisal, appraisal. Okay, so well, on this market. Appraisal doesn't mean anything, but okay. <laughs> That's correct. So being able to, and so, and the reason why I'm bringing this up guys is that it's real important part of writing an offer, including contingencies or removing contingencies 
referring to not having them part of the contract is very important in order for you to be able to convey that to your buyer clients of the importance of why it's still some contingencies are important to have in the contract still ultimately for their protection you know and still also to be able to remove from the contract also to give them favor of being able to have their offer accepted in this marketplace and again the reason i'm saying in this marketplace is because when when the marketplace changes and the marketplace will change this marketplace will not continue at this fervor you know in, perpe in perpetuity okay the market will soften okay and so at that point if it is a buyer's market what does a buyer's market mean now if if the market were to change to a buyer's market what what does that mean why um, the buy, the buyers in better position to get what they need an offer like maybe price or conditions right well easiest way to remember buyer and seller market guys okay is whichever market there is that we're in that it's the scarcity of it okay so for instance right now we're in a seller's market we have a scarcity of of sellers which means we have more buyers and that's why this it's a seller's market there's more buyers than there are sellers the buyer's market okay there are there are <clears throat> plain and simple there are more sellers than there are buyers so if now you have a buyer that wants to write up an offer on a property um, and there is 20 other homes in the neighborhood that are for sale and the one house that your buyer likes is now would be the one and only offer that is now on the table. Would you write the offer the same way in that marketplace that you think you would right now in this marketplace? Heavens no. Heavens no, you got that right. <laughs> All right. You know, most likely, you know, we would absolutely keep an appraisal contingency in, in a buyer's market. Why? Because what, what does an appraisal contingency connotate to not only us, but to the general public out there? Worth of the property? The worth of the property. And just like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, okay, typically buyers don't like paying more than appraised value. But in this marketplace, they are understanding that the reason why I'm, I'm writing off the appraisal contingency is because I recognize I'm probably going to have to pay higher than market value. And again, market value is the value of a piece of property when? At the moment of the appraisal. Not, not tomorrow, but, but today, the day of the appraisal. All right. So, so that's the reason why understanding what appraisals are and which ones are, I mean, what contingencies need to be in a contract and how to explain a contingency. Okay. And what that means, having a contingency in when you're representing a buyer protects the buyer that if in the event, all right, that you're not happy if, if the certain event occurs uh, that you're not liable. So as an example, do, does each of you have, well, here, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna put up on our screen here. I wanna have you take a look at E2, E2, all right? And for those that were on my, the, the last class two weeks ago, we addressed it but in a little, little different fashion. Who can tell me what that clause E2, uh, or no, excuse me, E1, not E2, E1, I'm sorry, E1. Anybody want to take a, take a snag at uh, what clause E1 is about? And I will tell you, it is a contingency. Any guesses? It's your loan that is, contingency. That is not the loan contingency. The loan contingency is on page two. Mm -hmm. 
Don't go in. All right. Here, matter of fact, guys, I'm going to talk to, even though this is from a buyer's perspective, I want, I, I want you to, I'm going to talk to you now from a seller perspective a little bit, okay? Because you need to know the contract from both perspectives. What's been going on with interest rates these last, the last few weeks with mortgage rates? They've, going up. They, well, they've gone up, they bounced down, and they moved up again a little bit. Did they not? Okay. Where, where is the 30-year fixed rate loan today conforming? About four and a quarter. It's in the fours. Okay. So what this what this particular clause is, guys, okay, is that if your buyer then says to you, you know, I want to buy this house and I'm willing to pay extra, but boy, I'll tell you, if we have volatility of volatility of interest rates, unless I can get my interest rate at four and a quarter. That's the maximum I'm willing to go and pay this price. And so what you would end up doing is you would fill in the loan amount, whatever the loan amount be, and then you fill in the interest rate, okay? Fixed rate, if it's a fixed rate loan, not to exceed 4.25%. So let's say now your buyer's offer got accepted but over, but by the time the negotiations got completed, rates have moved up more and rates have now moved to four and a half percent. This clause, although it doesn't use the word contingency, does it not? Do you see the word contingency in, in clause E1? No. Is, is a contingency. Because what that then means is the buyer has the right to be able to back out of the sale on the basis of him saying the lowest interest rate I can get is four and a half percent. I wrote the offer at four and a quarter percent and my and the seller accepted my offer with a four and a quarter percent rate not to exceed. And that makes it a contingency. Hence that makes it a contingency. That is absolutely correct. So What's what, it called? An interest rate cap is what it's, is what it, is what it's called. Okay, you guys, do you guys see that? So, one of the discussions, um, one of, one of the, the discussions um, when talking with your buyers, okay, because. What's very common is your buyers in this climate are going to go to you, wow, you know, I don't, I don't want to have to end up again purchasing a house at this price if rates are going to go up. But you have, and, and so you have to also understand that there can be some volatility of interest rates between writing of the offer and when the offer gets accepted. And when the buyer locks in their interest rate, because when does the buyer lock in their interest rate on their home loan? No, I mean, once the offer is accepted. That's right. That's the earliest time that a buyer can lock in their interest rate you know, is once they have an accepted offer, once there's a property to attach a loan to. A buyer can get pre, pre approved before looking at property one, but they cannot lock in an interest rate. So one of the discussions, which is real important to be able to have is being able to say, when, I, when you're representing buyers, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I understand the importance of this volatile you know, climate of interest rates uh, on their way up, all right? And, and I understand you don't want to be able to quote, have a, uh, a blank check in front of you of being able to accept any interest rate. However, one of the things when, we, when writing an offer, a good listing agent will look at is, are you willing to be able to accept higher than what your desire is? 
but you're willing to be able to bend a little bit. And so typically meaning that if today's rates are at four and a quarter, if I'm the listing agent and now end up reviewing offers on my seller's property, and I now see a, a, uh, an offer that comes through that caps the interest rate at four and a quarter, because the discussion that I'm having with my sellers, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, the buyer has a contingency on their interest rate. All right. And they've capped it out at four and a quarter. Interestingly enough, rate today is at four and a quarter. Meaning if you accept their offer today, if everything else is acceptable in this offer to you and, and you accept it without countering it, if in the event rates tomorrow or before this buyer locks in their interest rate goes up higher than four and a quarter, that buyer can, doesn't necessarily mean will, but they can back out penalty free, get their deposit money back, okay, and move on and leaves you hanging of now we have to go find the new buyer. So the discussion I have then with my buyers is Mr. and Mrs. Buyer understand, okay, because you have to look at it from a seller's point of view as well. Matter of fact, ultimately when we write offers, this is the dialogue that we want to be able to have with our buyers. We want to be able to make it a win-win. Okay, because you write up an offer where it appears it's win-lose, referring to buyer only wins, seller will only lose, and you have an astute listing agent on that other side, guess what's going to occur? Your buyer's offer not only won't get accepted, again, it may not even get a counter offer. All right. So again, knowing your marketplace is so important because boy, if the market is flipped, okay, and then now is a buyer's market, you're able to leverage it a, a, a lot more on your buyer's behalf, okay? But when it's a seller's market, when you're rep representing buyers, you now want to be able to do it. So the dialogue I would have is, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, today's interest rate's four and a quarter. You know, if in the event rates were to move and we were to cap it at four and a quarter, that means the seller knows that you could back out penalty-free. You have to be able to show your willingness that you're willing to go a little beyond where today's rates are if in the event rates were to continue to move up before you lock in your interest rate. I would advise that, and typically then at that point, I always advise a half percent higher than where the going rate is. I would advise for it to be at four and three quarters. That doesn't mean that you're going to end up getting a four and three quarters because if your offer is accepted, you're able to lock in your rate the very next business day with your lender. So at that point, if it's already, if it's still four and a quarter, it doesn't matter if rates move to four and three quarters during the escrow, you've locked in at four and a quarter. But at least then now the seller knows that you are, are willing and, and to have some flexibility. That makes sense? Especially in this in this you know volatile marketplace that that we're now in. Um, what's uh, what? Like, how long does it take after office accepted for that rate to get locked in? Next business next business day. When the lender gets the when the lender gets the the fully executed contract. What's the what's a fully executed contract, guys? All signatures by all parties, not some signatures by some part by some of the parties, all signatures by all of the parties. Because if the husband signed and the wife didn't, and the wife signed and the husband didn't, or the brother who's also on title, you know, didn't sign, it's not an executed, fully executed purchase agreement. And again, when I say fully executed purchase agreement, that also entails counter offers. Okay. It's, it, it's the purchase agreement, counter offer. You may have two or three counter offers involved. All of them have to be signed. Okay. In order to be quote, fully executed. Okay. All right. Um, all right. When writing an offer, we talked about deposit. Why do we have a deposit? Anybody know why they're Anybody know why we have deposits? Uh, is it good faith that your buyer is going to 
purchase a property and you're going to tie the property for a certain amount of time. True. Any other answers? Any, can anybody tell me what the three elements of a contract are? And this is going, and this is going to your real estate principles class. Three elements of what makes a contract. Nope. I'll give you a clue. Offer. Three elements of a contract. I just told you one of them. Meeting of the minds. Nope. Acceptance, acceptance. offer, acceptance, and uh, execution. You, offer, acceptance. Delivery. All right, now I want you to think about it. Think deposit. Money. Known, formerly known as consideration. All right, three elements of a contract, offer, acceptance, and consideration. So that's, and consideration can be as little as how much? 3%. $1. $1, it can be as little as $1. Anything of value is actually how the law states what consideration is. Giving $1 the minimum value of, of what consideration be. And so that's, that's the reason why there's deposit monies, all right? The seller accepts the offer. In other words, remember elements of a contract, and I don't want to get so much into contract theory, all right, is, is that the, the, each party is giving up something when, whenever there is a contract. The buyer is giving up their initial money as deposit, and what is the seller giving up? Tying up the property for the transaction. The ability of selling it to somebody else. Okay. So, so that, that's, what, that's what's taking place is that's the reason why you have deposits. Now, and again, in real estate, why do we make, them, make it so big? From a practicality standpoint, all right, we don't want buyers because of the size of our unit that is being uh, contracted with being a home, okay, that, uh, you know, if the deposit was $100, all right, would buyers be much more easy to just walk away for a hundred bucks? Yeah, it, it's designed to kind of smart a little bit that, you know, so that it doesn't waste the seller's time of having taken it off the market. The premise being, is that in the event, okay, see in this marketplace, is in, in the last year and a half, has it really been a big deal when a buyer is backed out of a sale? Even if, even if the buyer didn't have a contractual reason to back out, really actually, what, what did the seller do actually? Or what did that buyer do for the seller if a buyer backed out you know, of a sale, whether it was contractual, where he had the contractual reason to do so, or he, he, and he didn't and he forfeited his deposit to the seller? All right. What did him a favor? Did him a favor because what took place? What took place was the property worth more thirty days later, you yep. know, or worth less thirty days later in, the, in this market we've been experiencing the last year and a half. It's been worth more in the last year and a half. Every month, the property has been worth more than the than than the prior month. So, how would a buyer back out really has not been that big of a deal, other than a couple of weeks you know, uh, loss of time to a seller. But picture a different marketplace where values not, you know, where values are declining. Go back to, let's go back to, to 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009. What was, what was happening back then? It was a major declining market where each month the property was worth less than the month before. And so, yeah, it was a big deal when a buyer backed out because now when the seller had to put it back on the market, there's no way he was able to get even the same price that was initially contracted. 
So let's go back to deposits now. What do you advise your buyers to do in this marketplace? Of what side, you know, when your buyer says, how big, how big should my deposit be? What do you tell them? As big as you're comfortable with. Okay. Why is 3% the usual amount? Because that's the maximum that they can keep in case the deal falls through. Oh, be careful. Got to be careful here, Jim. Jim said, when I asked why, why 3%, Jim said it's because it's the maximum that the seller can keep. Is everybody in agreement with that? Negative. No. Why? Well, if it's FHA, then you will come with 3%. But if it's a conventional loan, you can go anywhere from 5% and up 10, 20, 30, 40%. All right, just, just so you know, deposits have no bearing on financing, on the type of financing. Related to the liquidated damages clause. Well, what's the liquidated damages clause? Anybody heard, heard of liquidated? Before? Has anybody sure. not heard of liquidated damages clause? No. Anybody want to take a stab as to what the liquidated damages clause is? Uh, didn't perform the contracted. Um, what was contracted? One more time. I'm sorry. Didn't perform what was contracted. What was on? What was needed? And what you signed to do in the contract, you didn't perform. Partly, you, you, you know, all right. Let's, let's take a look at the liquidated damages clause here, shall we? Let's, let's go take a look. Ah, come on, I gotta move here. Let's... There it is. It's clause clause twenty nine. Okay. So before before we actually delve into it too too much here, um, is the liquidated damages clause applicable in every contract? Real estate contract, probably. Probably. The answer is no. All right. First of all, let me go over what liquidated what what a liquidated damages clause is, and now let me go over it while you're reading the clause while I'm going while I'm describing it. Liquidated damages clause is a contractual clause in contracts, which means. And it's not just only isolated for real estate contracts. It means that it's an agreement in advance of what the remedy will be in the event that there's a breach in the contract. And in our particular case of real estate, it's an optional clause. And why is it optional? Because it has to be initialed independently by both buyers and sellers. Okay. If the if the buyer initialed it and the seller did not, granted by an oversight, does the liquidated damages clause apply in the contract? Certainly does not. Even if it would, even if the seller meant to initial it, but their listing agent unfortunately didn't highlight it or didn't didn't put it on the DocuSign if they DocuSigned it. And you then, the buyer's agent, when you received the contract back, didn't review it to notice that there was no initials by the sellers in that liquidated damages clause box. It does not apply unless all parties' initials are there. And again, what it, how it applies in our case 
It only applies to residential real estate, one to four units. So if it's a five unit commercial building, liquidated damages clause does not apply. If it's a 10 unit apartment building, liquidated damages does not apply. So it's one to four units, one of which the owner intends to occupy, referring to of, of your buyer. And, and if so, the maximum that the seller can retain is up to 3%. It doesn't mean the seller automatically gets 3%. It's up to 3% based on what the buyer has paid. So one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen by most agents, especially rookie agents, is if you're working with a, a, uh, an investor who wants to buy a single family home and you now, are, you now are discussing the contract with them, you're talking about deposit and now you're talking about liquidated damages. And you cannot, and just so you know, you almost could not or should not have a discussion about deposit without having it piggybacked right on the discussion of the liquidated damages clause because one washes the hand with the other, okay? They literally, it's like, it should be 1A and 1B is really what it should end up being. But it's further back in the contract, okay? It's almost, it's almost our last page of the contract. And so, so it, it, it's definitely one that, that uh, uh, if you're not having discussion with your investor client and you say, don't worry, Mr. Investor, all right. If in the event you end up backing out without having a contractual reason, the maximum the maximum you uh, could forfeit to the seller is three percent of the purchase price. Would you all agree that that that's an accurate statement? Yes. Oh, I just set you all up. The answer is no. Okay. Who was our buyer? An investor. Did I not say he was an investor? And he was buying yeah, he a single, and he wrote up the offer on a single family residence. But what are the conditions on the liquidated damages clause here? One to four units. So he satisfies the single family residence, but does an, investor, does an investor owner occupy an investment property? No. 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 So if you've ever heard the phrase, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law, this is one of those times that imagine then you told your investor the maximum you can lose is 3% of the purchase price. He backs out thinking, all right, I'm willing to, I'm willing to kiss off my 3%. But we're in a different marketplace than we now in. We're now in a declining marketplace. And that seller now says, uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna accept your 3%. He could, I'm gonna sue you under the legal provision of specific performance. Specific performance is a legal term, abiding by the terms of the contract. I'm gonna sue you to buy my house. And that investor goes, but, but my agent said the maximum I could lose is three is three percent. So when that seller sues the buyer, that investor, who do you think? What do you think that investor is then going to be doing next? Suing well, and suing you, the realtor. Why? Because you gave them improper advice, all right? So that's why, you know, you need to know who your buyer is. And this, and this here is very important. So whatever, what any of you then, for instance, let's say we got an $800,000 property, what's three, what's 3% 3 of 800,000? 25,000. $25,000. $25, and your buyer's putting $200,000 down payment. 
Would you ever, would you ever say your, to your buyer, Mr. Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, one of the ways that you can stand out against your competition is why don't you write, why don't you put down a huge deposit, put down a hundred thousand dollar deposit. Would you, ever, would you ever advise your buyer to do that? Now, mind you, this buyer's going to own or occupy, and it's a single family residence. Yeah. Dialogue would go something like this, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. One of the ways that you can end up standing out next to your competition, all right, is being able to write a big fat deposit check. All right. I would even recommend $100,000 because you're putting $200,000. You're putting nearly $200,000 down. And it all gets applied to what? Your, your down payment. The deposit always gets applied to your down payment. But, but we talked about the liquidated damages clause. And, and, I, and I'm in, definitely in favor of my client signing that. Again, I never, I never say you must sign that. I'm in favor of my client signing that because it caps the amount of damages the seller can have over a buyer. To what? Three, up to 3% of the purchase price if the deposit is there. In the event that you were to back out without having a contractual reason when you wrote a $100,000 check to an $800,000 purchase price, the seller then will be able to retain how much under the liquidated damages clause? Up to 3%. So that would be $24,000. And what happens to the balance of, of the monies? Go back to the buyer goes back to the buyer. So the dialogue that I have with my buyers, as an example, is this is one of the ways that you can stand out next to your competition because who looks like they want that seller's property more if two offers are at the same top sales price? The one who's put a $100,000 deposit down on an $800,000 sale or you know, the guy who put $15,000 down. <laughs> Who on paper, if you were the seller, I see a $15,000 check, or I see a $100,000 check, both with the highest sales price of $800,000, all right? Who looks like they want the property more? The one who put the hundred grand. And one thing sellers absolutely, aside from wanting top dollar, what do sellers want? Sellers want buyers to want their property, okay? If I've seen nothing over the decades, okay, hasn't changed. Every seller wants their buyer to want to buy their property. So, so that is just as an example, um, you know, of some some of the dialogue dealing with dealing with deposit. Now, what would you say? Let's take an eight hundred thousand dollar list price, and your buyer now ends up saying, "Well." I, I only want to. I, I only want to write a a, a, a fifteen thousand dollar deposit check. Okay, I'm only willing to lose fifteen grand if I were to back out. Okay, what do you what do what do you say to him? Think back to the interest rate cap scenario. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, understand, okay, because we're initially in the liquidated damages clause, which allows for up to 3% of the purchase price. Most likely when the seller and the listing agent sees this, they probably aren't going to be happy about it. Understand because the liquidated damages clause allows for up to 3%, if they have any weight uh, you know, uh, that they then will absolutely, especially if they compare it to other offers, all right, they're definitely going to end up wanting to have you come back uh, with, a high, with a higher deposit. And then they're also going to have you sign an additional form under the liquidated damages clause. Anybody know what that form I is? I understand. I don't Say know that if I can send this to you. Somebody from United Equipment. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh. <laughs> She's talking to somebody else. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, so the reality be is the discussion you would have is you can do it. It's not advised. 
All right, especially in this kind in this marketplace. All right. Now again, if you were the listing agent receiving an offer and seeing that the that there is fifteen grand to a fifteen thousand dollar deposit on an eight hundred thousand dollar purchase price, and you and you look and, and you see that the liquidated damages clause was initialed, three percent of eight hundred thousand is twenty four grand. You go, huh? There should there should you know. Because that's what I do when I represent my sellers. I said, if, if liquidated damages clause is initial, then, and, and, and if they're putting a down payment in excess of 3%, that means that, that they could put a deposit for at least 3%. And so, uh, you know, even back in the day where there was zero, zero down payments, 100% financing. I still required when I was the listing agent, I advised my sellers to go back on the counter offers, okay? Because it would, literally it would be, a, the buyers were writing $1,000 deposit checks on $600,000 purchase price to be able to then get a $600,000 loan, no money out of pocket. And I would say, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we're countering to the buyers 3%, it's an $18,000 deposit. And, and the buyer's agents would come to me, okay, worst thing they could do to me, okay, and say, Steve, they're good people, they're good, you know, they're solid buyers, they're gonna buy it. And I said, great, if you're that confident, then you write the $18,000 check, okay, deposit for, and put it down on behalf of your buyers that are so good and solid, all right? But I'm not having, I'm when I represent the seller, I'm not having my sellers, okay, only, have an escrow with a one thousand dollar deposit check in hand, yeah. And so, so it's same same thing, okay. That it's all being able to communicate to your buyers the importance of being able to do it. Now, again, do I ever say you have to? You must. Absolutely not. You know, Mister and Mrs. Buyer, how bad do you want to buy this property? You know, your discussion needs to be that frank with them. How bad do you want to buy this property? You know, if you don't do at least what we would refer to as the bare bones minimum of expectations, all right, the reality be of your offer even being put into consideration. All right, now here, I'm even gonna tell you something for you less experienced agents that you're not gonna like hearing, but, but if I do it, I know other agents do it as well. When I'm a listing agent and I get multiple offers in on, uh, on, on my listings, I'll scan the offer within 20 seconds, be able to know, is this an offer I want to advise my clients on negotiating with? Notice my vocabulary. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying, is this an offer I want to accept? Is this an offer I want to advise my clients? Why? I don't own the home. If I own the home, then I'd be saying, then I'd be using the word we. Okay. But if I don't own the home, all right, my dialogue is, is do I want to advise my clients? And if I end up seeing a deposit in this, especially in this marketplace, that's less than 3%, and I see liquidated damages clause initial. If I scan down to the interest rate cap and I see the interest rate cap is either at or below today's market value, market rate. If I end up seeing, and we haven't even talked about this yet, okay, the investigation contingency remain at the default of 17 days. I will advise my seller if in the event there is another offer equal or even higher to them that, or let's say we had that your, your offer price-wise was equal to, to the top uh, other offer. I'm going to be advising my client that most likely I'm going to advise you to accept the other offer. And here's the reasons why. If I, if I see a deposit come in from a buyer written from an agent where there's, and we, and today everything, the minimum down payment is three and a half on FHA. So we know there's not, because we don't, we no longer have 100% financing. Okay. 
unless you're unless you're a VA, that's a different story. But and uh, um, but at that point, I'm going to say this agent is either inexperienced or he doesn't know how to effectively communicate with his buyers, with their buyers. Because at that point, you know, in this kind of a marketplace where there are multiple offers that liquidated damage clauses initialed, I want to see 3%. And any agent worth their salt should know that. And if I see less than 3%, that is a major strike because that means this agent either doesn't know the contract and just it just shows like a blinking blinking bulb where they don't know how to effectively communicate the importance. And if we have a choice between your offer and the other offer that nets the same amount of money to that seller, I'm always gonna advise the other one who was written correctly in my book, all right? Because we also have another round of negotiation to go through. And what round of negotiation is that? No, oh, that's it. This is after the offer is accepted. After the home inspection. And that's where emotions run high. Okay, is negotiating after a home inspection, the home inspector has now just gone through the house with a fine tooth comb, and there is all this red in the listed in this report. All right. And so Buyers, especially first-time buyers, have a tendency, anything that's listed in red in an inspection report, okay, they feel that the seller should end up fixing or giving credit in lieu of. And a seller's perspective is, you know, I've lived in this house for the last 30 years, and this house has been a great home for us. That None of, you know, these, these haven't been issues for us. And so the emotions at that point are the highest even higher than the initial round of negotiations of getting the offer accepted. And boy, when I'm a listing agent looking at offers of which ones to advise my seller to accept, I want to be able to, be able to work with an agent who knows how to effectively communicate with their buyer. Because we, they got to be able to say, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, yes, the inspector put it in the report, but they're, they fall into the category of non-health and safety, okay? And yes, you as buyers have the right to be able to ask for the moon, okay? But understand the seller is absolutely not obligated to give anything, not a nickel, because these are as-is sales. Our homes are as-is sales. All right, guys. We've been on a little more than an hour and I barely touched the surface, all right? But one of the things as, as you can see, I don't just, and, and I very easily could have just gone over point by, this is what this means, this is what that means. But I think, and I'm hoping that you're able to take away of the importance of how you communicate with your client. You know, does a lot more than just being able to, how do I fill in the blank? All right. Selling real estate is not filling in the blank. It's not. It's because what's going to, you know, that's exactly right. Real estate and writing, con writing offers and negotiating offers is about conversations. And so... Um, you know, one of the things, the, the best advice I can give every one of you who's not confident in the contract is to be able to sit down and try to go over it as though you were writing up the offer in person and being able to say, what does this mean and what does that mean? All right, because you're going... You're going to get those clients who, who, end, who ends up saying, I don't digital sign anything. I don't like it. I don't trust it. I want to sit, I want to sit across the table from you and be able to have you explain it to me. 
And there's nothing worse, you know, I've been able to feel as though you're not able to explain something to them. But what's even worse is if you try to BS them because you give them wrong information. Again, what can happen if you provide them wrong information? You can get sued. That's exactly right. You're, you, you're better off, you better learn the saying, I don't know, gee, I really don't know. But again, if you end up saying that for nine out of 10 clauses, all right, how confident do you think your client will be in your ability? And so, you know, the contract and negotiation goes hand in hand. It's a, it's a hand in hand process. You cannot be a good negotiator if you don't understand the contract. You know, there's, it, it, it is impossible. It is absolutely impossible to be a good negotiator if you don't, if you don't understand the terms of the contract to be able to become the advisor. And, and again, you know, we just covered the tip of the iceberg on it. Um, and so, you know, I'll be around. And, and if anybody wants to, uh, you know, email me later, you know, uh, my email address is, uh, I, don't, I don't have it written down here, but you can feel, feel free to write it down. It's Steve dot next, N-E-X-T, phase, P-H-A-S-E-R-S, -E at gmail.com. Any last questions before we end today's session? Phasers, R-S at the end, look like next phasers, at gmail.com. Great class, do you have more planned? I have nothing on the calendar at the moment. One of the things, you know, to really do it justice, um, you know, it, it, we can't cover it in an hour, okay? Uh, minimum is a, would, would be a four hour class, all right? Can we do it? You know, well, and, I'm up and, for it. It, and <laughs> it's a type of thing that, you know, I would love to be able to, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I as much as I love Zoom instruction of being on one, as the instructor, I'm not, I'm not keen on it because I, I don't like sitting or standing in one spot. I like moving around. I like using the board for examples, okay? Um, you know, I'd love to be able to have a, uh, a, a live instruction class, okay? Because- Okay, I, let's do it. Let's do it. I, I like to be able to have interaction um, because if you notice, you know, because I recognize each of you come with different levels of experience. I do have you guys try to think and give me the answers what you think it is. Um, and yes, I will try to try to trip you up purposely. Okay. Um, but I think that's also how you learn a little bit. Um, you know, for um, for those that aren't aren't in South Bay, you know. Who, who's not in, South, in, in the South Bay office? Casey, are you in the South Bay office? Hey, I'm in the, I'm at the, I'm sorry, the coastal properties. Okay, coastal, all right. Yeah. And let's see, who else? Wait, Joseph, what about you? I mean, Calabasas. Calabasas, okay. And uh, uh, John, I know you're, you're in our office here, right? Yeah, you're in our Cece? I'm in South Bay. South Bay as well. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things I, you know, I'd like to have a bigger turnout. Um, and, you know, it's, it's definitely one that uh, um, I'll see, I'll see what we can do about getting something scheduled in the month of April. Okay. And, uh, to see if we have a, a four hour window that we could end up uh, putting in. And uh, because that's, that's really what, what one needs to really get a, a, a decent handle. Now, will four hours make you um, proficient? No, it's not gonna make you proficient, okay? 
but it's certainly going to cover a lot more of the basics that we covered than what we covered today. Um, and, and what's really important then is I, I think the best type of, of uh, thing that you guys could do for yourselves is to try to go over the purchase agreement at, you know, and explain it to, try to explain it to a family member as though a family member is your buyer, you know, and go, what does this, what does this mean? What does this mean? And then write it down or put a question mark if you can't confidently explain what it means. But believe it or not, believe it or not, I think the problem that most agents have who don't really grasp it, and, and I think you can then get a good flavor of then what our clients must feel, is because there's just so much text and so many clauses that you guys get just overwhelmed just on the, uh, the size and magnitude of all the words on the page. And if you literally just look at and, and, and put a piece of paper on all the other clauses below it and above it, and just kind of isolate the one clause by itself, okay, you're going to be surprised of really how much you're going to be able to interpret if you just stop to interpret the clause itself. You know, I mean, just like the liquidated damages clause. All right. If you just read it, okay. If you just read it, it makes sense. You know, granted, when you hear it explained already in a conversation form, like, like you're hearing me do it, it then hammers it home. All right. You may not be as eloquent initially, I've been able to explain it. But at least it, it really won't sound and be as foreign to you as you think it will be. So, all right, guys. If there's not any other questions, we're gonna we're gonna call it a day. Thank you, Steve, for your presentation. You're very Thank welcome. You. Anytime. Thanks, guys. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very informative. Very good. What's that? Uh, oh, you do have a question. For, yeah, how long did your how long did your executive plan for derivatives? No. Or, or, I mean, uh, I mean, compared to with something else. Nope. So they could be sued the entire. Potentially. Potentially. Potentially, they could. They can be. Okay. okay. And and the reason I use the word potentially is, is in order for a seller to sue for damages beyond deposit. They have to be able to prove to the court where they've been damaged, all right? So let's take, let's take this marketplace real quick as an example. Investors, investor contracted to buy a single family residence. Investor backed out after all contingencies have been signed off, all right? Um, and, and, and let's say it's even a 3% deposit, doesn't even matter, okay? And, and, and seller now says, I want more than 3%. You know, I want 100, I want 100 grand. And, that's, and that buyer investor who backed out says, are you flipping nuts? You know, finally goes to court, okay? Um, and well, let's say it goes to arbitration. Let's say under the contract, arbitration was initialed and agreed and it goes to arbitration. And, and it then goes to arbitration. Uh, and, but it gets, it gets to arbitration six months later. The, sell, the seller with the investor was in contract for $800,000. The buyer then backed, again, buyer backed out without having a contractual reason to back out, okay? Which meant the seller was entitled to retain the forfeited deposit as, as damages, but he wanted, and so that, that would be $24,000, but so he doesn't receive it because he's fighting it. And so it, was, it, it remained in escrow, in the escrow account. He now goes to, they go to arbitration six months later. That seller now sold his house three months, three months prior, okay? And he sold the house for 825,000 in this marketplace. 
what do you think the arbitration the, uh, is going to do? They're going to say, Mr. Seller, where were you damaged? You had a contractual price of 800,000 and he backed out, which meant, which means then you're entitled to retain his 24 grand. All right. And, but now you resold the property at 825 in excess of what the contractual price of the investor who backed out did. Most likely the arbitration. And then if, again, if it ever went to court, they're going to say, where were you damaged? We're not going to, we're not going to give it to you. However, flip the markets now. The market is now in a declining marketplace and, it, and it's sliding fast, all right? And so he was in contract at 800, but now he couldn't sell, you know, he couldn't sell the property for more than 700 when he, to the next buyer. I want hundred grand. Guess what? He's probably gonna get it, you know, as, as a result. So, so yeah, so, and there's still other strategies that can be implemented with regards to deposits as well and when the deposits are given and the whole bit, all right? And you'll see that if you read the contract, okay, right below initial deposit dealing with additional deposit, uh, you can be able to, to play around with that as well. Nice thing about real estate and contracts, anything can be done that's agreeable between buyer and seller, as long as it's not against the law. <laughs> okay. Yeah. At that point. So that that's that's what makes it really nice. You know. So uh, you know, at that point, does it always have to be cash uh, that's given? No. I remember years. I remember years ago in my early years. All right. I had a buyer who didn't who didn't have the actual cash at that moment for the deposit. What? It, but they they had a big beautiful diamond ring. The seller agreed to be able to, to have that diamond ring as the initial deposit. Because how much does the deposit have to be? Minimum of $1. In real estate sales, typically, but it doesn't have, again, it's known as consideration. And consider, definition of consideration, anything of value. Doesn't say cash. Okay. Could be the could be the title to to a, an automobile as an example, if the seller was in agreement to to, to taking it. Everything's negotiable. So I sold houses before with the with family pets. Got you know safe you know the seller left the family pet, a couple of cats, years ago, written in the contract. <laughs> okay, everything everything's negotiable. So. You know, you can have fun with it once you understand the foundation of, and, and granted, 16 pages long is even more, but, but I don't want you to think of it, you know, it, it's not scary once you know it. And the beauty, once you know it, you'll never forget it. Okay. And, that, and, and that's the beauty of it. So, all right, guys, you have a good day. We'll catch up and hope, hope to see you on the next training then. Bye-bye now.